He's done more to popularize science than anyone on the planet. He's been called a visionary, an activist, and occasionally a grandstander. But to hundreds of millions of television viewers worldwide, he's the man who gave them the cosmos. In a small corner of the cosmos, in the Bensonhurst section of Brooklyn, New York, Rachel and Samuel Sagan had found each other. 1934, Sam and Rachel welcomed a son into their little world. They named him Carl Edward Sagan. Sam, and especially Rachel, were intent on making the best possible life for their child. There, there was no name for what he wanted to be. He was interested in astronomy. He thought that there were probably little men on Mars. And he thought, even at age 11, that by the time the space age came about, he'd be too old to be a, an astronaut. When Carl was 13, Sam Sagan moved his family to a better life in the suburb of Rahway, New Jersey. At Rahway High School, Carl was an overachiever, voted both class brains and most likely to succeed. As Carl's high school yearbook read, astronomy research is Carl's main aim. An excellent student, he should achieve fame. But when Carl accepted a scholarship from the University of Chicago, he left rockets behind. Chicago had no engineering department. From then on, Carl left the nuts and bolts to others, concentrating on his real talent for thinking big and reaching for the stars. He was also able to get others to think big. As captain, he led his intramural basketball team to university-wide victory. Carl's major attribute as a basketball player is he was a terrific rebounder, a very um, aggressive and energetic rebounder. He was known for the sharpness of his elbows. Carl was as aggressive in advancing his career as a scientist. He talked his way into a summer job in the lab of Nobel laureate H.J. Muller. Muller was working on the origin of life on this planet and possibly others. Sagan was hoping to work with Muller on the big question. But Muller had the eager young Sagan tend his fruit flies. Carl stayed at the University of Chicago to study for his doctorate in astronomy and astrophysics under another mentor, Dr. Gerard Kuiper. Kuiper was a maverick astronomer who studied planets and the possibility of life on other worlds. Just as the space race was getting off the ground, Carl made his own giant step. He proposed to a young geneticist named Lynn Alexander. Carl and Lynn were married on June 16, 1957. They had two sons, Dorian and Jeremy. In those few years, Carl had also started his career. His dissertation, predicting a severe greenhouse effect on Venus, made waves in planetary circles. If we were to find just one example of life elsewhere, for example on Mars, then we would be uh, much more justified in making this, uh, this grand generalization that uh, life is not restricted to our planet, but is, uh, is a pervasive component of the universe. The only life he wasn't concentrating on was his own. In 1963, he and Lynn divorced. She took the kids, and he took up an invitation to teach astronomy at Harvard. In a collaboration with the Russian astrophysicist I.S. Shklovsky, called Intelligent Life in the Universe, Sagan tried to be very scientific about whether extraterrestrials had ever visited the Earth. I think it's uh, much more reasonable if you, uh, if you want to speculate on the possibility of, of extraterrestrial intelligence that uh, there are very rare visits from extraterrestrials to the Earth. There's no evidence for this. I just say that's not implausible. But to have several visits a day, I think, is straining credulity. Though Sagan considered the UFO craze a chance to get public attention for the real stuff of astronomy, sensationalizing science was not Harvard sort of behavior. Cornell University snapped Sagan up. But he did not want to leave Harvard without an artist he'd been dating. 
Linda Salzman. He and Linda were married on April 6, 1968. That fall, Sagan joined the Cornell faculty and became director of its new laboratory for planetary sciences. Well, this, this is the first photograph close-up of Mars ever obtained in human history. We're looking right close up. The Mars Viking landers did not find life on the red planet, but the media had found a new star, Carl Sagan. You see that letter? It looks like a, an English B. I suppose it's some Martian guy carving his initials on a rock. Uh, <laughs> is he likely to write in English? <laughs> By 1977, Sagan was a hit on The Tonight Show, had a book on the bestseller list, and was featured on the cover of Newsweek. His next project had a longer shelf life, about a billion years. Sagan created a record of the sights and sounds of the Earth that would travel on the spacecraft Voyager out into interstellar space. Sagan worked closely with the creative director of the project, Anne Dream. For months, they toiled to capture the whole world on a single disc. They found they shared the same ideas and the same dreams for the project. She was afraid she might be falling for the great man. Carl Sagan felt the same way. On June 1, 1977, they declared to each other that they were in love. The terrible problem was that Carl was married, and he had a young son, Nick. But for the transcendent relationship he had always been after, Carl left them for Annie. Sagan's next project was a message to Earthlings. He and Anne planned a 13-part public television series on the history of astronomy and the adventure of exploring space. Carl Sagan would be the host of Cosmos. Cosmos took three years of filming in over 40 locations in 12 countries, ranging from Egypt to India. It was exhausting and exhilarating. And there was a general tension and healthy kinds of disagreements that happen on these projects. But the pressures on Carl were tremendous. He was spreading himself too thin. Then Sagan received the most upsetting news of all. His father, Sam, was diagnosed with terminal lung cancer. Sam and Rachel Sagan moved in with Carl and Anne for their last months together. We were constantly torn between these 18, 20 hour days and giving his parents, and particularly his father, the kind of uh, love and support that we really wanted to give them. Sam Sagan did not live to see the completion of Cosmos. He died in October 1979.